We have Patricia Killiard, Deputy Director of Academic Services, chairing this session for us. And on the panel, she is joined by Yannicka Adema, the Radical Open Access Collective and Coventry University, with Ros Pine, Director of Open Access Books from Spring and Nature, uh, Rupert Gatti, who is a Fellow of Trinity College and the Faculty of Economics and from Open Book Publishers, Lara Spiker, Head of Publishing at UCL Press, and Ben Den from CEP, who just heard us. Okay, well, welcome to our panellists and, and welcome to everyone who has come back for this um, session on innovations in um, open access publishing. Um, I was very pleased to be asked to chair this because, um, like Martin, I think um, I too have been hearing about open access for, for 25 years um, and share some of his frustrations around um, the very slow pace of innovation, uh, particularly around um, open access monographs. I was very heartened this morning by, uh, to, to hear, particularly by the Royal Historical Society, um, it's a, a very honest reflection on the experiences of, of this. So we have um, five uh, panellists um, drawn from a very diverse group of perspectives uh, on open access publishing from the Radical um, Open Access Collective, um, from uh, an established um, open access publisher, uh, a large scientific publisher uh, work with, working with open access, and um, university presses, both um, established, uh, very established, and um, new and working um, exclusively with, with open access. Um, so I'm going to, um, I think, reflect also on Jess Gardner's point in her welcome this morning. We, uh, we hold a variety of views, some of them very strongly, uh, on open access monographs, um, and we don't need to agree, but I think what we are searching for here is a way of moving forward by understanding each other better, um, and perhaps shaping experiments and discussions that will allow us to develop um, more sustainable um, models. Uh, and we can do that in shared spaces. Um, and this is one of them. So if I could um, ask each of the panellists to reflect for five for five minutes and invite uh, Yannicka yeah. to, to start. Yeah. And I'm going to be very strict about timings. So yeah, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, so I'm here today to represent the Radical Open Access Collective, uh, which is a community of scholar-led, not-for-profit presses, journals and other open access projects. So set up in 2015, uh, the collective promotes a progressive vision for open access based on mutual alliances between the 60 plus member presses and projects that are seeking to offer an alternative to commercial <coughs> and legacy models of publishing. So based on the contingent and diverse philosophy of radical open access, the collective means to work towards a framework of resilience, of strength in diversity and in numbers. So radical open access as a philosophy uh, seeks to push back against the dominance of market-driven versions of open access in order to promote non-commercial and not-for-profit scholar-led approaches to publishing. As such, open access is positioned as an affirmative and ongoing critical project. So it's not one thing, a model or an overarching project, but it consists of various groups, peoples, institutions and projects with their own affordances. Now, radical open access embraces experimentation with academic publishing and with writing, with the form, content, and process of academic knowledge production. So it involves the recognition and nurturing of underrepresented cultures of knowledge, from para-academics to precarious scholars and academics from the global south. It envisions publishing as being situated within and as part of a relational ethics of care recognizing that we have a responsibility to all those involved in the publishing process. This is also visible to the sharing of resources, information, skills and time, and the building up of the collaborative communal knowledge that's already available within the different publishing projects and gifting this to the community. As such, the Radical Open Access Collective website and information portal provides information for those interested in setting up and starting their own publishing uh, open access projects. So the site currently lists resources about the collective, including our philosophy, resources related to scholar-led publishing, and a directory of scholar-led presses. The information portal on the website provides curated lists of publishing tools and funding opportunities for open access books and articles on topics related to scholar-led publishing, marketing, and editorial advice. 
The collective also runs a mailing list, an informal location for strategizing and discussing specific queries. Now, the Radical Open Access Collective embodies <coughs> what Sam Moore and I have characterized as horizontal forms of collaboration, forging alliances between small independent projects. So this is an important step in creating economies of scale in providing mutual aid and logistical support, shared services and best practices. But the collective also sets out to be a starting point for more vertical or multi-stakeholder multi collaborations that form another important strategy in making not-for-profit independent publishing more resilient, including collaborations with libraries, universities, funding agencies and infrastructure providers. So the thinking here is that these kinds of initiatives will be able to become resilient by scaling small. So they tend to work according to capacity, so from a few books a year to several dozens, in order to keep it manageable to the people involved. However, when taken together in different constellations, these independent community-driven pro projects do have the potential to create a resilient ecosystem to support the scholarly columns, commons. So here, operating communally can aid in overcoming both structural and strategic disadvantages while maintaining diversity and providing a framework capable of making publishing more resilient. Now, one important way in which scholarly presses have proven to be resilient is in bringing down costs, highlighting that it's possible to publish cheaper and faster than traditional publishing outlets. So if they use PPCs, they tend to bring these down. They charge them according to what authors or their institutions can afford or waive them completely where needed, next to actively helping authors finding funding for their works. So working in a non-competitive fashion, many school-led presses have also been very transparent about their finances, as you can see from the examples here in this slide, uh, of writings on the cost of publishing and of running a press that these presses have produced and provided and shared with the community. There's also an active focus on using, building and sharing open source tools and platforms to make publishing more efficient, to reduce reliance on commercial solutions and intermediaries and to create cost efficiencies in the system. All right. So this efforts towards resource and skill sharing characterizes the largest scholarly publishing community as a whole, where there is a focus on knowledge sharing overall um, and on a mentoring of smaller or newer initiatives of co-publishing and community and consortium forming on various levels. So we see this emphasis on collaborations also in their experiments with publishing models. So from communal editing and crowdsourcing models to other collaborations and funding arrangements with public not-for-profit institutions such as libraries and universities. And for example, we also have the Scholarlet Group Collective and also the Copen Project as have already been described as prime examples of those. So these are like some really quick overviews of uh, the kind of experiments that are happening within <coughs> these groups. If you want to know more, please check out the website. No, it's not responding anymore. Or get in touch. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, now I'd like Rosalind uh, Pine to uh, give a perspective from uh, a large uh, scholarly publisher. Sure. So I look after the Open Access Books Program at Spring and Nature. So to be clear, that covers many imprints, but particularly Springer and Palgrave Macmillan. Um, so a brief introduction to our program. We first experimented with open access books in 2011. We've had a formal open access book program in place since 2012 for Springer and 2013 for Palgrave. And we've published more than 800 open access books so far, with the numbers increasing every year. To give you an idea of the shape of that list, monographs and edited collections make up about one third each of the list of open access books, and the remaining third is comprised of a mix of other book types, including those short form, mid formats, um, proceedings, and a few reference works. And we also offer the option to publish open access chapters in edited collections that are otherwise closed access. We publish OE books across a very wide range of subject areas, both humanities and social sciences and STEM disciplines, and that reflects our book publishing as a whole. And whereas in journals publishing, the vast majority of our OA articles are in STEM subjects, I'd say our OA books portfolio is about 50% humanities and social sciences, um, including business and management, and 50% STEM, and perhaps 10% humanities overall, to give you 
Uh, we use Creative Commons Attribution License, so the CC BY license are our default and our preferred license as it's the most open, but we do allow authors to request other licenses, and I think I'm with Martin on this one in that my attitudes have been softening over the years and we are starting to see more requests for ND licenses, which we're willing to accommodate. So I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we face as a big monograph publisher in the context of the current policy environment. We've heard UKRI is developing an open access policy for monographs. Coalition S has indicated that we'll have guidance by the end of 2021. Um, we've actually long been supportive of open access at Springer Nature. We have more than 600 fully OA journals. We published more than 90,000 articles OA last year. We have what I think is the largest OA book program of any major publisher. So actually, we're very well positioned for a more open future. We've spent a lot of time training staff internally on OA books. There are 400 book editors. This is not a trivial task. Um, and we've also spent time adapting all of our systems so that we can publish books open access. So if the funding were available and the policy direction were clear, we could easily publish a lot more open access books than we do now. So in fact, one challenge that we've faced is we've been trying to encourage the take up of open access books at a time when relatively few funders have been doing so and there's been relatively little engagement outside. The lack of that clear policy direction or imperative towards OA books means we find awareness and understanding is often low amongst book authors or potential book authors. And that leads to further issues that we've already talked about today, misconceptions that OA books are not peer reviewed, misconceptions that they don't have print counterparts, concerns about perhaps justified concerns about perceptions of quality of OA books, especially in the context of hiring and promotion. And so these are all hurdles that we have to negotiate before we can interest people in publishing OA books. It's actually a much more intensive process perhaps than encouraging people to publish a regular non-open access book. And for the record, um, our OA books are commissioned by exactly the same editors as our non-OA books. They're peer-reviewed. They must meet the same editorial criteria. That is an absolute given. And they all appear in print. Um, other challenges. OA is moving at different speeds around the world. So Europe is very much leading the way. We have well-developed funding streams in Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. France and Sweden have national action plans for OA transition that include books. The Netherlands and the UK are working on OA policies specifically for books. But even here, you can see there's a diversity of approaches, even within Europe. Um, and then if you look beyond Europe, it gets a lot more diverse than that. Um, there is activity in the US at institutional levels, um, but the decentralized nature of the US means federal policies are unlikely. Awareness and interest in OA remains lower than in Europe. Engagement from university presses varies hugely. In Asia, we find attitudes vary by country, but in general, we do not see government agencies and funders advocating for OA. And if you'll forgive a very broad generalization, interest in OA is much more kind of local and it's about authors feeling that it can give them more reach and more recognition for the work published, which indeed is, should be the case with OA, but it's coming sort of ground up from the authors rather than top down. There are benefits to that, but it's probably still moving slower than in Europe. Um, and that does create challenges for large publishers, which are extremely international as we are, as we're trying to manage the needs of authors around the world who have uh, different ideas about open access and want perhaps different things from their books or have different expectations placed upon them from their institutions or their funders. Um, one last point on challenges. Um, policy patterns established in the journal world create challenges for books heard so much about green and gold OA in the context of journals. Um, I won't explain this because Matt has already done that for me, but um, I absolutely echo concerns that have been raised so far about the utility of green open access for books. And I also question whether green OA, which is by definition codependent on the subscription model, is the best way to increase access to research longer term and whether it best serves monographs. Thank you very much. <laughs> Would you like to make your remarks? Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Open Book Publishers, based here in Cambridge. Uh, we publish, uh, as you heard this morning, uh, uh, open access uh, monographs, primarily in the human humanities and social sciences, but not exclusively. Uh, to date, we so we've been going for about 11 years now, uh, and we've published just over 150 titles in that in in that time. And again, I, I, I hope I don't need to stress, but they're all rigorously peer reviewed and it goes through the same um, processes as you would expect from a high quality academic press. Uh, 
I, j I just wanted to um, raise a, a couple of things. Uh, so I've got maybe five points here leading on from the various discussions that we've had. The first is, is why and what are we trying to do with open access? And, and one of the things that we've heard is that the monograph as a long form content can, to, to some extent is used as the research device. And, and I think that it's worth pulling up, separating out a little bit between the digitalization of a monograph, making it a PDF and making it free to read online, and making a digital monograph. And, and I think that, that one of the things, while the majority of our works have come to us as completed monographs, and we have really digitized them, they've been monographs and we've made them freely available online, Increasingly, we're seeing people wanting to engage with digital monograph, and they're engaging about embedding images and audio, embedding third-party content, databases, etc., into the, the monograph itself. Not just so that it's a pretty picture, but so that they can engage with research in a slightly different way. And if they know that the readers are engaging with this content in a different format, it allows them to do different research. And, and that means that it's enabling different types of research. Now, that's not necessarily just open access. I think open access facilitates it. It's also just about digital content. But I think it's an important part to recognize as we move towards open access that this is an opportunity. Open access is not just about mandate and digitalization. It's an opportunity to really move forward scholarship and engage with all of these opportunities in an open way. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention quickly was business models. We've heard a lot about them. Uh, so just to, to mention our business model quickly, uh, we do not charge book processing charges. So uh, authors can and do publish us without any subvention at all. Uh, we have three sources of income, and about each of them generates about a third of our revenue. The first is the sale of the printed works. The second is uh, a library coalition model. Uh, uh, that uh, libraries become members and they're supporting our publication through a membership um, uh, program. And the third is we ask authors to apply for grants if they know that any are around. And, uh, and, and about a third of our authors are able to do that and, and come along with money to contribute towards the costs of publishing. So those are the three sources. Um, so that, so, so what, what becomes about sustainability and, and scale is we get uh, asked a lot. So that's great, but does it scale? And, and so we're producing about 25 to 30 books a year. So the question to ask is how would we become a publisher of 250 to 300 books a year? So how do, how do we increase by an order of magnitude? So we thought a lot about this. And I think the, and the answer we came to is we shouldn't. <laughs> It would be a whole lot better if there were 10 other publishers doing 25 to 30 titles each. And we sustain the diversity of publishing initiatives, the diversity of editorial panels, the diversity of, of, of disciplinary approaches, which I think is really fundamental to monograph publishing and, the, and, and in humanities. So again, some quick data. How are we going for, how am I going for time? One minute. One minute, OK. So in the REF 14 panel, uh, some data um, <coughs> Uh, that from um, uh, Simon Tanner, uh, there were eight and a half thousand books submitted uh, to the to the uh, panel D. Um, that's the uh, humanities panel um, uh, from twelve hundred different publishers. Uh, so that's a huge number of publishers that are contributing to that. The top ten publishers contributed less than fifty percent of the titles. So therefore, there's a huge diversity of publishers that are out there, and that diversity needs to be sustained. And the business model to sustain that will differ from, book, from publisher to publisher to publisher. So we, I don't think we need to look for a single business model that is going to do it all singing, all dancing for everybody. All of them will be different. We've got three, four, five different business models on the table, and there's more out there. And what we need is a structure that facilitates that diversity of business models. And can I, 30 seconds more. Uh, I'm minus 30, so I have to speak very quickly. Um, uh, that setting up that distribution, the distribution channels are the places where you get returns to scale. And control of the distribution channels is the real, my, in, in, is my concern, is that 
the scale at the distribution channel controls the academic content down the stream. And that's why I'm particularly excited to be part of the Copen bid that Research England and I'm pleased I found out this morning, Arcadia has also uh, contributing to, uh, to build infrastructures to support diverse publishing initiatives uh, to be able to sustain the, uh, open access publishing. Thank you very much. And uh, now we hear from Laura Spiker, um, who is speaking for uh, UCL Press. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm just going to talk um, about uh, UCL Press and tell you um, uh, what we have been doing since we launched um, four years ago. Um, so we launched as the UK's first fully open access university press. Um, many others have been um, set up since in, in the UK. Um, and we are now um, four years in and have published over 100 open access books. Uh, we have eight journals. We recently um, launched a mega journal as well. Um, we, um, we're now publishing um, about 45 books a year, and this has grown gradually over the last four years. So we um, are really delighted to have seen such an enthusiastic take up of our model. Um, we publish um, scholarly monographs, edited collections, short monographs, as, as many others as have mentioned, a few textbooks as well, journals, um, and the mega journal I mentioned, and everything is made available open access at the point of publication alongside print copies, and we do all that simultaneously. We publish mainly in humanities and social sciences, um, and we do publish both UCL and non-UCL authors, so we are open to all. Uh, we charge non-UCL authors a book processing charge starting at about £5,000. We have a waiver scheme as well for up to five non-UCL authors um, to publish with us um, per year. But of course UCL academics are still free to publish um, wh wherever they choose and, and, I, and I say that because it's a question I get asked quite a lot. Um, so since since we launched, um, those those books that we've published have been downloaded um, around the world, getting on for two and a half million times, um, and and this really um, demonstrates the, the the purpose of of UCL setting up the press was to ensure that research can be read uh, far and wide, and to um, to challenge this this prevailing model where scholarly monographs. Um, typically in, in a lifetime could sell as few as 200 copies and this was something that when UCL set up the press it, it wanted to um, address. Um, interestingly, um, so we, we've gathered a lot of data um, on, on those books from the platforms that we distribute to and we distribute quite widely and I think this is um, I just want to highlight this as, as a key strategy for open access presses that um, just making it freely available online is one thing, but there are now a huge range of open access platforms where publishers can put their books, and those are growing all the time. Um, and we aim to get to as many of those as possible. Um, our most downloaded titles, well, our, our, the, the highest downloaded title is a book called How the World Changed Social Media which has been downloaded 351,000 times um, since publication just over three years ago. Um, and other high downloads will be in the, in the high tens of thousands. Um, but even books that are relatively niche uh, are typically downloaded five, six, seven, eight thousand times. So that's still a huge access to books that otherwise uh, might only have had a, an audience of a couple of hundred. Um, in terms of global reach as well, what we're seeing is, is quite interesting. Um, so as well as the, the US and UK, as you'd expect, um, and Europe, we're also seeing uh, lots of access from India, China, the Philippines, Nigeria. These all appear in our top 15 countries uh, for downloads. Um, we, um, we do uh, put a lot into the, the marketing of the books, and I think that is important as well, going um, hand in hand with the dissemination. Um, we put a lot of effort into um, sending out review copies and to social media and supporting authors in all the ways they would traditionally expect. Um, when they go out to conferences, etc., then we want to aim to promote the books uh, where they are appearing as well. Um, 
We, um, I just want to quickly touch on, um, on the, the print sales uh, that have been discussed quite a lot as well. Um, we are seeing print sales um, holding up. Um, in so we don't have any uh, before or after to compare to uh, because we're completely new. But for niche titles, we will see sales of 75 to 100 copies typically. And then other books uh, c can be 300, 400 uh, copies. So um, as, as Margot um, helpfully plugged us earlier, um, that, that is a, a, a typical um, ratio that we're seeing. We don't have enough data to know for certain that print sales are or aren't affected by open access, and we don't know what will happen when everything goes open access, but that's just really sharing our experience. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and when we turn, return to, to, to Ben Dane, um, who is yes. going to conclude this panel. Okay, so you've all heard enough from me already, so I'll make it brief, he says, and then ramps on for 20 minutes. Um, uh, CU date, CUP dates from 1534, I'm sure you all know it's part of the university, so unsurprisingly the state admission just to unlock people's potential with the best learning and research solutions is very much in line with and supports the aims of the broader university. Um, we currently have on the OA front, on the Cambridge Core platform, 56 published OA books. Uh, 38 fully OA journals of further 253 hybrid journals containing OA content. Uh, we've got quite a good number of open access titles in the pipeline. We're definitely seeing an increase in the number of OA titles we're signing. I'll be completely honest and say that, like many, many other publishers, up to now this has been quite a passive ingestion. It's been driven by uh, author requirements and available funds to publish OA. So, you know, we have a model, we've developed a model. Um, I don't think, and I think many publishers would say the same thing, that we've gone out and really proactively sold or been consultative with, 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 with that model. Um, recently, as Chris pointed out before, we've been quite proactively experimenting with different open access models. Um, we're real advocates of open access publishing. Uh, we're very keen to contribute. We want to help guide and shape policies around open access as they emerge. Um, Everyone said the same thing, you know, I'll say it again, it can't be said enough because there's some myth-busting that needs to happen here. We don't distinguish between our OA books and our, and our other books uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the process that they go through. Um, I, want to add a little, I want to add one point about this, which I think is it's really important to bear this in mind as the debate around OA books develops because historically all publishers have been lousy at communicating the value they bring uh, to book commissioning and the curation process. And I say that very honestly, and I charge any publisher to tell me different. And the reason why we've been so bad at that is because up to 20 years ago, there was a huge aspect of publishing, which was a, a very, very, very difficult to surmount logistics business. If you wanted to publish a book, you needed warehouses, and you needed lorries, and you needed a huge supply chain, and, and a whole bunch of different things. And that's still true for print books, although POD, et cetera, is making those barriers to entry uh, much, much easier. But what it meant was there was a whole other side of what we did, and, and we did that then too, which was tremendously valuable. We didn't really have to talk about it, so we're not very good at talking about it, but we're getting better. Um, uh, we, we, we're really committed to finding sustainable models for open access uh, research uh, uh, books publishing. Um, I think. Uh, Something that, 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 that's really struck me when we've been talking today is that when we talk about models and we're talking about innovation here in, 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 in open access publishing, uh, we're talking about two different things. We're talking about innovation in the books themselves and we're talking about innovation in funding models. And that latter piece of things, personally, I think that the sooner that we can get past those blockers so that we can start to get truly excited about the potential that open access offers, the better. Um, and I want to make a couple of points about that, so on the book itself. Um, uh, you know, we, we early experiments around, uh, Rupert was talking just now about embedded video, etc. Um, you know, I think those are, those, those are really, really exciting things. I think early experiments around sort of um, uh, dynamic content have been quite misaligned with user behaviour. Um, I think that, you know, there have been suggestions of splitting books up into chapters so that they can be accessed that way, that sometimes ignore the uh, narrative development structure um, of, 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 of some of the things that we that we do. Um, I think there are models that are going to come out, but I don't think that we've quite um, uh, found them yet. And the, the point that I want to make, just to get people thinking a little bit about the question of innovation in 
books themselves, um, uh, uh, not necessarily innovation in funding, uh, but separate to the idea, the, the very good ideas about embedded content and dynamic content and all of those kind of things, is the question of relatedness and discoverability, because open access in a perfect world should make all of those barriers go away. I'm going to make one more point. Famously, a couple of years ago, one of the big textbook publishers launched a subscription model for textbooks, and the CEO referred to this as the Spotify for textbooks. Now, I looked at that and I thought, that's, that's like saying Spotify only uh, have EMI records or, or, or Warner or, or, or something. That's not true. That's not a genuine Spotify for textbooks. If you move that into another area, you know, it could be a bit like me saying in a research model that I think that there are researchers out there who will only research and cite CUP books, and that's plainly not true. So I think there's a huge question around relatedness and discoverability and browsability within the academic ecosystem, which open access, if it's properly, properly shepherded, should really open up. You know, the idea of dynamic pathways, curated pathways of learning, and that kind of interbrowsability between content. And, I think that's probably the most exciting question, and I will stop Thank there. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we have just about 10 minutes for questions, and but before I open it up to the floor, um, I'd like to ask if any of the panel would like to respond to some of the um, uh, perspectives that we've heard, or whether you'd prefer just to go straight to the floor. Okay, it's all yours. Any questions? There must be some. So I have a question for Rosalind. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between Palgrave and Springer. Mm. And I'm wondering if you found at Springer that the Palgrave pivot model had brought um, new thinking to your thinking about open access projects at Springer. So full disclosure, I started at Palgrave 12 <laughs> years ago and was then subsumed into Springer Nature as a result of the merger. So you're, so you're very well placed to answer that. <laughs> um, well, Springer also has a Springer Briefs model, and as others have mentioned, many publishers have experimented with <coughs> mid formats. That it's interesting when we started with Palgrave Pivot, the idea was really to try to find something that was between a book, a monograph and a journal article, and we introduced things that at the time, and this was what, 2012, 2013, seemed innovative, you know, we had abstracts and we had keywords for all of our, for every chapter in the pivot, and even though the <coughs> book as a whole could still be seen as a complete work, we weren't trying to say you should read these chapters individually, we were just trying to make it easier for people to find them. Um, and we had envisaged it as this mid-format, and it, it never really became a mid-format, it became a short book. And I think that sort of happened to everyone who's tried to create these mid-forms. I've never seen something that's genuinely fallen into that space. And perhaps that's because we conceptualise books and journal articles so differently, and we value the idea of this sort of coherent narrative that you can create from a book, that no one really wants to see it as a, a collection of articles. So, I mean, on the one hand, I think it has been valued by uh, all of those mid-formats, have been valued by scholars who felt, yes, I have something to say, but it doesn't necessarily fit into the space of the traditional full-length monograph. Uh, whether Springer necessarily benefited from Palgrave's innovations, I don't know, because Springer had already done quite a lot in terms of thinking about its platform and thinking about elements from the journal side that could benefit books. But I do think there is a lot on the journals in terms of metadata, discoverability, that books could benefit from, and it's something which is much easier to do as a big publisher than a smaller one. Thank you. Any more questions? Must be. Lauren. Um, I, I saw on Twitter that someone had commented that this conference is even quite optimistic about the future of uh, monograph <laughs> publishing and open access, which is great to hear. Uh, so I was wondering, if we reconvene this symposium in, say, 10 years' time, which of these issues we're talking about today do you think would still be relevant, and do you think there might end be any other new issues on the horizon that are going to get to happen? I don't know. I can. I, 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 what? So, you know, what? What would it be nice to have achieved? I think the issue of diversity is a really, really, really big one, and and in a, in a digital world, 
there is the concentration. Uh, we've seen time and time again digital markets being concentrated by a small number of big players. And, uh, and, and I think that if that happens, that could happen for monographs as well, that we're going to have uh, concentration on, on a single distribution panel uh, which can then control the downstream um, flows. So I think that's a real danger and I think it could happen. So I really hope that doesn't. So I hope in 10 years time we'll have been thinking about what diversity means, about what community ownership means. And you know, the, this bid that we've got is a community owned open monograph uh, infrastructure for publishing monographs. I don't actually know the definition of any single one of those words. Um, but community owned is a really, really, really important part of it. And I don't really know what that means, but it certainly means it's not owned by an individual institution or an individual, uh, whether a publisher or, non or, or uh, commercial or non-commercial. What does diversity in control of scholarship and distribution of scholarship and facilitating that mean? Um, yeah, I hope we've really moved on in 10 years time to really be thinking through that. Would anyone else like to yeah, respond? Yeah, if, if, if I may, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, um, to, to uh, build, build on, 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 on that point a bit. Um, I think that um, I've, had a, I've had a complete mind blank. <laughs> Come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, do you have any, any perspectives of where you'd like to see um, UCL in 10 years' time and what kind of problems you might have solved by then? Um, well, I... I'd love to. Um, I'd love to see us delivering this this model and this service to as many authors as as we possibly can, uh, because authors are responding so positively to seeing their research being really widely read, and I think this um, this really means a lot to uh, particular areas who want their research to be read by the subjects that that they're studying. For example, in anthropology and sustainability, this is. This is really critical, and I think it could change the way uh, research is actually undertaken and, and the way books are published. Um, I think it will be interesting to see whether open access has any effect on how books are written, because many of our authors um, tell us that they would think about the actual writing and presentation differently if they know it's going to be an open access book, in terms of writing it more accessibly, uh, just... Um, not in terms of the, the, the fundamental underlying scholarship, but in, just in terms of the language used and the expression and possibly even the approach and the, the structure, just ways of making it um, more accessible, not just in terms of it being free, but being more easily um, understood and accessible by all. Thank you. Ben. OK, coming back to me. Sorry about <laughs> that. You know, it does happen. Of course, I remembered as soon as the pressure was off. Um, it's coming back to the diversity point. I think that's something that I would really like to see change in the next few years. Is I think at the moment, the system of education about the choices which are available to academics who want to publish is pretty fragmented. And I think that, and there was a very um, interesting thing, and I, and, I, and, I, and I forget the details, but there was something I read a, I, I read a while ago, which was... a a guy who'd gone to a bunch of American uh, universities and he'd looked at the information that they had on university websites for career advancement for early career researchers, you know, and what the options were available to people, and nobody was mentioning open access at all. And I think that's a huge question right now. And coming back to Rupert's point about diversity, I think that, that it is, there, is, there is a real obligation, not on any one institution, some are better than others, but on institutions across the world, to be really, really um, helping to communicate to early career researchers who may not be going straight to, to, to publishers or thinking about publishers with these questions at that point in their career, what the options are that are available to them and how diverse those options are, what the funding options are, and as the business models develop, what those models are as well. And it's something that um, I think um, came up this morning, this idea of moving the conversation further upstream. You know, we've talked, we've talked a, a bit about you know, a lot of the kind of uh, uh, innovative models that are happening now um, are publishers uh, um, having books funded open access post contracts, and, and, and that's too late in the process. I think that's something I would like to see change. Okay, thank you. Yannicka. Yes, thank you. Um, well, what I would like to see is, and I, I hope this is like an outcome of more open access content being available too, um, is a move to more acknowledgement of how publishing is part of the research process. Um, 
And I think this becomes also important once we kind of start to acknowledge that um, in a digital environment, we probably will start to publish more during a researcher's life cycle. So this also comes back to this discussion around um, versions, right? Like if, if, if we start off with like an article and then a mid version and maybe something that develops much more during the process of a publication, um, that we kind of start moving away from this idea that there's one object, which is this kind of published book that we have, right, that we work with now towards the multiple forms that this uh, work can take. And also once we start to publish this in an open way, what kind of adaptations we can get from that in a kind of environment in which people will start to respond more to these kind of processual publications. And I'm quite interested to see what kind of shapes this can take. And there's a lot of people already doing experiments around that, around um, kind of, yeah, pre-publishing towards post-publishing review, towards reusing of, of existing data and uh, existing kind of content uh, and data mining and things like that. So I'd, I'd like to see that develop much more in the future. Well, thank you. And um, we're right out of time. We've finished exactly on time. So it only remains uh, for me to thank all of our panelists for their presentations and uh, their willingness to engage with the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.